Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. This is the last climactic final class of Acts. Somebody want to open us off in prayer? Go no, for it. All right. Dear Heavenly Father and Almighty God, I thank you for us getting to come together and learning how you spread the gospel through your people all the way up until now, which is to run. Father, that has changed the, the, the course of history forever um, by doing that. I ask that um, as students leave, um, they retain the information they learn in here. Father, you would just grant traveling mercies that everybody would be able to travel in a safe manner and that uh, we would be able to use the information that we learn in this class to more effectively spread your gospel message about the kingdom, about your son Jesus, and about your plan, about the catastasis. We ask you all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> I apologize about the uh, size of the print. That's as big as I can get. I just, I just hit print really quick instead of saying, oh, I need two on every slide, so I'm sorry uh, about that. But we got there. Okay. Um, last time on the book of Acts, this got to catch up with our story. Um, Remember, Felix had taken the, uh, uh, he was a novice, but Felix actually took the uh, place, or sorry, he was, he was replaced by Festus, right? The horses. Yes, okay. And uh, Festus uh, allowed Paul to appeal to Rome, yeah. and he had a, a, a kind of a little mock gathering with uh, Agrippa the second. And they basically concluded that Paul was innocent, and uh, they're allowing Paul to leave. And so what we're going to see today is Paul's voyage and travel um, to Rome, how he gets there, and the difficulties that ensue there, and then what he does once he gets to Rome. Okay? So, let's kind of move forward. <clears throat> okay. Um, to understand like, like the kind of journey that he takes at this point, we really have to look at this. Now, he, thus far in the story, he has not got any further than, you know, than, than here. We have uh, Macedonia, Achaia right here, uh, Philippi, you're going to have uh, Corinth and Athens down here. Um, he has not gotten any farther than this, okay? So, remember, he was in Jerusalem. They took him up to Caesarea. That's where he was. And so he's going to move up the site, and that's where they're going to set sail. And they're going to they're go all the way to Mira. They're going to go to um, Sinaitis. They're going to travel all the way down to Crete, try to get to this place called Fair Havens. There's going to be a little island here called uh, um, Cadra. Uh, I think they actually just spelled that name. It's Cadra. Uh, there's going to be something here about the uh, banks of the um, Seertis right here. He's going to, they're, they're, they're going to drift. Drift, 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 all the way over here to Malta. And if you actually look, like that's a long way to drift. And they're going to go to Syracuse, um, uh, Regium, and then to... Uh, um, Pentioli, and then they got three different towns. Um, the Appi form, three taverns, and then to Rome eventually. Remember, Rome is the name of the city, the name of the country is Italy. Don't get those two confused. Uh, but Rome is not a country, Rome is a city. So you might want to, I, I put this first in your PowerPoint so that you can flip back to it so we kind of see what's going on here. Um, I'll tell you what, if I was starting off from here, and I was going to go to Rome, you know, I might go here and then kind of cut through, like, like I would definitely wouldn't go down this way, like, they're definitely taking the longer route, and so a lot of this is going to be pertaining to weather and the time of the year they do this, so we're going to keep this in mind, so as best you can, just try to follow along with the story as we move forward here. Okay, all right, so uh, all of chapter 27, the first 15 verses of chapter 28, are the voyage to Rome, it's a long trip. Okay? Normally, Luke can just say, and Paul went from Jerusalem to Caesarea in one verse. But he's going to spend 50-something verses talking about his voyage to Rome. All right. Um, let's just kind of start off here. Can somebody read um, chapter 27, verses 1 and 2? When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Andromedian ship, 
which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. Gotcha, okay. After Midian, I say? Um, something like that. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what all that means there. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, when it was decided that we would set sail for Italy, who's that? Luke. That's Luke, okay? One of the things we're going to see here is that Luke accompanies him on his way to Rome. And so you're going to see a lot of we and us type texts, and you're going to see a lot of details that were there because Luke was there able to record a lot of these things, okay? So this chapter details the beginning of a long trip to Rome. Um, many of the details recorded in the ensuing events are a product of Luke having personally accompanied Paul on this voyage. One might ask why Paul, or sorry, why Luke would accompany Paul on such a long trip. It's not like a short trip. It's not like, hey, let's go to Chick Fil A. You want to come ride with me? I mean, like, this is a long trip. Uh, it's going to take months and months and months. Okay. Um, this first vessel, and by the way, it's going to take three different ships for them to get to Rome. Um, was headed for Mira. Uh, it is likely a cargo vessel rather than one primarily intended for ferrying prisoners to Rome. Okay. Um, passengers would therefore be required to provide their own food, their own bedding, their own blankets, materials for washing, and cookware. Okay? Now, Roman guards of prisoners uh, typically would provide only the bare minimum subsistence for prisoners in captivity simply to keep them from starving. Okay? So if you're a prisoner, you would just get just enough to survive because um, if, if you're being transported to Rome for execution or for whatever it is, um, then uh, the, it's, it's the, the Roman guard or the centurion. It's, it's his responsibility to get them there a lot. And so they're going to make sure they have just enough food to survive. Now, they're, they're not going to give them, like, a whole bunch of protein and stuff. You don't want their, you know, getting strong. You're just, you know, just enough food to, to survive at this point. But um, it was allowed in, in, um, on some of these voyages to where you could uh, bring somebody to prepare food for you, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Um, let's see. Uh, next thing that I'll uh, just kind of unpack this a little bit more. Uh, Pliny the Younger uh, mentions in two of his letters. I'll actually give, we'll give you a copy of this. Um, I'm actually taking this and passing it. Yeah, gotcha. All right. Um, he mentions in two of his letters um, how he requested that Roman citizenship be granted to his exceptional physician. Who in the story is a physician? Luke. Luke. Okay. All right. And this request was subsequently granted by the emperor Trajan. Okay? Um, and we've already noted that Paul's citizenship has granted him special privileges during his imprisonment. Um, it is safe to say that Luke could also acquire a citizenship so that he would have been allowed to accompany Paul. Not to mention the added value of having a physician on board of a ship. Okay? So here is a letter. Um, Uh, let's see, was it? Oh, book 10. Gotcha. Okay. We're all there. So at the very bottom, it says uh, Pliny to the Emperor Trajan. Okay? The Emperor Trajan was uh, one of the Roman emperors at the beginning of the second century. So this is what Pliny says. He says, When I was ser seriously ill last year, sir, and in some danger of my life, I called in a medical therapist whose care and attentiveness I cannot adequately reward without the help of your kind interest in the man. I pray, therefore, that you grant him Roman citizenship. He is a risen alien, and his name is um, Arhorcres. Um, and then he goes on the letter, and he asks for Roman citizenship for a couple of the people. By the way, when you look at that letter, like, how long is that letter? Short. That's pretty short, okay? When you compare that to some of the letters in the New Testament, do you think these letters are short, or that Paul's letters are long? All letters are long, okay? In fact, the, the, the letter that Paul writes that is the closest to being normal, it's actually like Philemon. Yeah. And we're like, oh, that's just such a short letter. But like letters like Philemon, um, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude, those are just normal-sized letters. So mm -hmm. something like Romans would have like overwhelmed people. 16 chapters, or 1 Corinthians, 16 chapters. Okay, so we actually have the letter that the emperor Trajan wrote back to him. It says here, it says, thank you, sir, for your promptitude in granting full citizenship. Or actually, sorry, this is a, yeah, we plenty writes back in response. So he tells us that the infiltration gave full citizenship to uh, these people uh, and to his therapist, um, um, our poor friends. Okay? So we have um, evidence here that uh, citizenship can be given to exceptional physicians 
And uh, that would make sense. I mean, why would Luke, who, from the perspective of, of these centurions, these Romans, seems just like a nobody, why would he be allowed to come in and take care of Paul? Well, if he was a well-to-do guy with an education, who was a physician, and if he had Roman citizenship, then it's likely that um, he would have been able to accompany this. I'm just trying to make sense of why in the world Luke was there, and why was he allowed to be on that ship, okay? I mean, it's not likely that uh, the cops let you ride with them when they take someone away to jail. Like, no, you, don't, you don't just ride along on that kind of stuff. That's the kind of uh, thing that is being asked of. Okay. Um, another traveling companion, this guy named Aristarchus. Aristarchus was mentioned by name there uh, in verse 2. He was a Macedonian from Thessalonica. He's already showed up <clears throat> uh, in chapter 19 and chapter 20. Um, uh, when he was uh, with Paul in those uh, adventures, okay, he accompanied Paul and Luke. Both Luke and Aristarchus are mentioned as Paul's co-workers in PHLM. What's PHLM? Philemon. It's Philemon. Okay, it's not Philippians. It's Philemon. Philemon 124 and in Colossians 4, 10, and 14, suggesting that these letters were written during Paul's imprisonment in Rome mm -hmm. around the year 61 through 63, Okay. How do we know this? Because they're there together, they're Paul's co-workers, while he's in Rome in, in, in prison, okay? It wouldn't make sense that he mentioned these guys, like, while he was in Caesarea, or while he was in prison in Ephesus, okay? So that's, it's, it's those sort of things we can use to actually date some of Paul's letters. So it's just kind of interesting that both of them are mentioned there. Okay, um, a centurion is in charge of many prisoners, and his name was Julius, okay? Named after Julius Caesar, I imagine. Uh, he was to oversee the transportation of the prisoners to Rome. Now, Paul's reason for heading to Rome was the exception, being a Roman citizen requesting a higher trial with Nero himself. The remaining and majority of the prisoners were likely already convicted and were to fight in the bloody Roman gladiatorial games for the amusement of those living in Italy. That's really cool. That's like, we know this, okay? So, how do we know this? Because we know from Suetonius, we've already seen Suetonius before, because Suetonius told us about Claudius. You can take a copy of this right here. You can kind of get a sense of what, uh, what, these, what these games were like. This is like specifically under Nero, because every single emperor is going to deal with gladiatorial games differently. Um, if you saw the movie Gladiator, Gladiator you have uh, two emperors there who are actually real emperors. Marcus Aurelius and Commodus are our two emperors. And you can, just from that movie, you can see that they had different attitudes when it came to the Colosseum. Okay, so different uh, emperors had different uh, appreciations for this. Okay, um, so this is what it says. This is in uh, chapter 12, which is XII. Okay, these plays he, Nero, he viewed from the top of the Proscenium at the gladiatorial show, which he gave in a wooden amphitheater erected in the district of Campus Martis in the, within the space of a single year, he had no one put to death, not even criminals, okay? See where it says a single year there, letter C? If you look over on the left, what does the letter C mean? Thousand? No, on, on, on the left side of the page. Oh, on the bottom. Footnote. See, see right there? AD yeah, 8058, okay? Oh. All right. So guess what? By the time that these guys are transported there, Nero had already been doing this for five years, or you know, three to five years, okay? So he already had this, this understanding, okay? So he didn't like deliberately put people to death, but he compelled 400 senators and 600 Roman knights, some of whom were well-to-do and of unblemished reputation, to fight in the arena, okay? So he didn't just put them to death. He didn't just throw them out there and say, all right, release the lions. He actually just pitted people against people. Some of these guys were like noble guys. They didn't do anything wrong. I mean, Nero's a, he's a little crazy, you know. <laughs> All right. So even those who fought with the wild beasts and performed the various services of the arena were of the same orders. He also exhibited a naval battle in salt water with sea monsters swimming about in it. Besides the uh, fiery dances by some Greek youths uh, and handing each of them certificates of Roman citizenship at the close of his performance. <coughs> The thing there with the naval battles is that he, they would actually like make it into an aquarium. They would fill it with water and like have mock naval battles with like cannons and stuff like that. Like, that's, like it's they do this in like a makeshift arena. So, uh, guy, but like this kind of stuff was going on there. Like and he talks about lots of different ways of doing that. So, so, so Paul was being transported to Rome to have this this talk with Caesar, but he's there with a bunch of other. 
um, prisoners, and they're not the same way. So when they, do you think they're excited to get to Rome? No. No, because once they get there, what's going to happen then? They're going to die. Yeah. Fight the guards for our levels. Oh! <laughs> All right. I have another one later, so I can make sure the volume's up. Those poor guys. All right. So this first vessel, it is an ad Ramitian ship. You type it into your word processor, it'll underline it red. Acts like it's not a word, all right? Meaning it had its home harbor um, in Adramitium, which is a seaport in Nisia on the west coast of Asia Minor, okay? So when the ships um, uh, are named that, that doesn't mean that they're going that way, that just means that's where the ship make, you know, makes birth. That's its home harbor, okay? Its home base, you could say. Um, Paul is specifically mentioned as being treated with consideration by these soldiers of Julius. Can somebody read 27 verse 3? The next day we put in at Sion, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go with his friends and receive him. Yeah, okay, so again, now, now why, why would it be that, that Paul is getting special treatment here? Okay, more, tell me something else though. He's really smart. He's really, okay, really smart. What did we learn last week about why Paul would be treated differently? Oh, what? what? Oh, oh, good. Zeus. Let me no, I'll ask you a leading question. Why was it that Festus had to have the second meeting with Agrippa? You remember why he had to do that? He had to do it because he didn't know what to write in this report. And it made a big deal about the report that he had to write as to why Paul, the seemingly innocent guy, all the way from Jerusalem, is being taken to, uh, to Rome, okay? And in this report, he probably mentioned something like, he's not really a terrible person. He's not dangerous, okay? So Julius picks this thing up. He's like, he's a Roman citizen, and he just wants to do this. He's just some Jew. He's not a big deal. Like, you know. He's not a yeah, he's, he's not a threat. Not a threat. Okay. Um, likely due to the Roman citizen and the reports in Nero written by Felix, okay? Uh, from Sidon, they set sail north. Talk on the map. You see. They sent sail north and then the west uh, to Mira. Uh, at this point, the crew swapped ships for an Alexandrian ship headed directly for Italy. So if an Adamentrium ship had its home harbor in Adamentrium, then an Alexandrian ship would have its home harbor where? Alexandria. In Alexandria. Alexandria is a city in Egypt. 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 Okay? No small and significant country. All right. Um, all right, uh, Acts 27, 38 later informs us that the ship is a wheat ship, a wheat ship, okay? One of approximately 80 vessel, sorry, one of an approximately 80 vessel fleet, which carried between 200,000 and 400,000 tons of wheat and barley a year from Egypt to Rome, okay? This was a, it was a massive fleet, 80 ships it took to do this, okay? You know, that's a, that's a lot of wheat and barley, all right? This service was so important to the stability of the empire that anything willfully delaying the arrival of grain to Rome was legally punishable, okay? They didn't mess around with this kind of stuff. They, they like their they like their bread. They like their carbs. All right. Um, we start to see in this, this story um, that there were contrary winds. Can somebody read uh, verse 4? From there, we put out to sea and sail under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. All right. Um, remember, I saw back on the map. In the map, they had to like kind of instead of go straight over, they had to kind of duck down um, because the winds were contrary. They were hoping to block these crazy winds um, with an island, big island. Okay. Uh, we also see there are difficult conditions in uh, verse seven and verse eight. And what this did is it created danger, storms, and visibility problems for ships, okay? Today, the way that we get places is that we take our phones and we use GPS or we use a map. For them, they would use the stars and constellations and that sort of thing, okay? They didn't have, like, detailed maps like we do today, okay? And they got really, really good at looking at constellations and learning how those things go. If you were, like, a sailor by trade, you would know those. But if it's cloudy outside, how do you know where to go? You know what to do. If it's really stormy, not only is it dangerous for your ship, because you, you, you know, it's, it's just a bunch of water coming, there's winds, and it's not level, uh, but you can't see where you're going, you can't see the direction, you might go off course, and you could be 
you know, moving your boat into like some shallow water. That's not good. Okay. Um, all right, the general understanding among experienced sailors was broadly the following, okay? You can actually see um, there are a lot of people that write about safe times to travel and unsafe times to travel in these particular oceans, okay? May 27th and September 14th, these are good times. Good times. So summertime, good time to travel, okay? But from uh, March 10th to May 26th, so this first little bit, and then from September 14th to November 11th, these are times of diverse and changing weather, and it's risky. Some people still did it, but it was, it was risky, okay? But from November all the way to March, it was extremely dangerous times. Extremely dangerous, okay? Cicero, in his, um, uh, in his article, his article, but his, his book, like, to the, to the familiars, to his friends, he attests that some impatient sailors sailed dur during mid-November, and they suffered shipwreck. Too bad for them. Okay, I, I got a, one, one copy of what he said. Uh, the point is, like, everybody knew that there were certain times of the year when you weren't supposed to travel. Like, it was just bad, okay? It would be like going on a road trip when it's, you know, snowing, you know, two feet outside and the roads are just terrible. You just don't do that. Like, um, sure. the point is, if you were an original reader of, of the book of Acts, you would, you would catch this. Is there not another one? Look at that. Awesome. Um, you, you would see here, based on the chronological markers, that they're traveling at a time which is going to create, you know, an interesting story. It's going to create some drama. So he writes this, uh, from Cicero to Tiro, okay? Um, I, Tullius, and Cicero, and Quintus, and warmest greetings to Tiro. We left, as you're aware, on November 2nd. November 2nd. Is that, uh, where does that fit on our timeline here? Uh, no. November 2nd well, is, uh, and it's, it's kind of iffy. It's, it's, not, it's not terrible, but it's not the best, Okay. All right, we arrived at um, um, uh, Leucus on November 6th and at Actium on the 7th. There, on account of the weather, we stayed during the 8th. From there, we had a particularly nice passage on the 9th uh, to Corre um, so Correra. Um, they were at um, Corsira until November 15th and then held up by the storms, okay? November 15th, um, we are now into the bad times, okay? On November 16th, we proceeded 120 uh, stages to Cassio, uh, the harbor of the Corsarians, and there we were held up by the contrary winds. Notice the same language, contrary winds, right up until the 22nd. Okay? Meanwhile, those who patiently put on the sea, and many so did, were shipwrecked. They died. You know, it's, it's just kind of known that these time periods are bad time periods, but you know what? Some people still risked it. Okay? Well, what? what year was this they were traveling? 15. That Cicero was traveling? No, no, no. That, that Paul was? Yeah. I think Paul was traveling in the year 60. Okay? okay. Some people think it's around the year 59. Um, you know, but I, based on the chronology that I've really tried to keep pretty straight ever since Paul had gotten to Jerusalem, and, and based on the fact that we know when uh, Felix was in charge, and Festus was in charge. Um, I think we're in the year 60. I think we're at the, the, towards the end of the year, around the year 60. We're going to see some of these marks right here. Okay? Some people do think it's 59, and I give a couple of those variations for some micronology when we go up. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, readers of Luke, they would have been attracted to stories of shipwrecks, okay? Um, and lost at sea kind of tales. Similar to how modern people like movies with explosions and plane crashes, okay? Like that was that was like the, the drama in, in these Roman novels, stuff like that was was uh, shipwrecks um, because there would be pirates and a lover would be lost at sea and then they would eventually find their their, their spouse before they got married. Um, like these are these are kind of like the, the exciting stories, you know. And, and Luke is kind of make sure this the story gets in it because it's something that keeps people excited. He's not just giving like normal boring history. He's able to you know put in these little details here, but. Um, people, if they were to come across a story in the ancient world that had a shipwreck, they're like, ooh, wow, it's about to get good. Okay? It's kind of like when two Jedis come together and they, you know, they pull out their lightsabers. You're like, okay, something, something's about to go down. That's the feeling. Okay. Hmm. All right. Um, next thing we see, um, from Issia, the ship sails west to a city on the southwestern tip of Asia Minor called Snidus. 
Okay? So at this point, you kind of keep in mind, you've got, you've got Asia Minor or on the southwest tip here. Okay? The winds force the ship to alter course and to sail south. That's not good. They're supposed to be going over, but now they have to go south. Okay? After further difficulty, the ship lands on the south side of Crete and Fair Havens. Okay? So now they've, they've moved south. They've got, this, they've got Crete, and they're on the south side of Crete, and they're in the city called Fair Havens. Okay? Uh, Luke uses the fast of the Day of Atonement as a chronological marker to note how late in the year it was. Can somebody read chapter 27 and verse um, 9 and 10? When considerable, cons oh, wow. considerable time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. And he said to them, Men, I perceive the voyage will certainly be damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and, and the ship, but also of our lives. Okay. Now, Paul, being the hero of the story, has to be the one that kind of speaks the common sense, like, hey, this is pretty late. Now, when is this time? Okay. Um, uh, so, there, the way that this particular um, holiday works, not on a particular, like, day, like January 1st, something. It's on, like, the fourth of a particular month, or the fourth week after a particular month. Um, if the voyage was in the year 59, the Day of Atonement would have been in the very early of October, while the Holy Day would occur in late September in the year 60. So I think something like late September, but he does say that um, the fast was already over, so we don't know how far over. So maybe guessing, maybe we're probably like at the beginning of October. Maybe Let's just say October 1st. That's kind of where we are on this hit, okay? Now October 1st was where in our... In the middle of it. No. Yes, in the, in the middle, okay? It's, 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 uh, it's changing diverse type weathers. Uh, it's not great, but it's not like the worst, okay? All right. Now, uh, Paul here is saying, hey, um, you know, he warns them. There's going to be damage and great loss that's going to occur to the cargo and the ship and the passengers. But the centurion, understandably, you can, you can understand him, he chose to listen to the pilot and the owner of the ship instead, okay? Who's Paul? Who's this nobody? You know, if I don't listen to, like, the guys who own the ship. By the way, this word for owner it could also be translated as the word captain. If there's some controversy as to what the, the passage means, uh, the verse means. Okay. And then they cast a vote, and the majority decide to head to Phoenix, a harbor on the west side of Crete. Okay. So they had uh, Crete there in the island. They're on the, the kind of south center part. Um, and, and wasn't too far away. No, no, no. no they're, they're, just, they're, they're still moving over. Okay. Um, a favorable wind from the south influenced them to set sail. However, a dangerous wind, which probably, it's kind of hard to figure this out, probably means the northeaster, the major, like, terrible wind from the northeast, made it impossible to land in Phoenix, okay? So keep this in mind. So they're, they're on this island of Crete. They're trying to land over here in Phoenix, okay? And so they're kind of moving along here, and they want to park right here. But there's a wind coming from the northeast, okay? So this, so they're trying to sit there and like park here, but the wind is like pushing them this way, okay? So they're they're having a hard time with this. That's what's going on. Okay, uh, they're forced to submit to the wind pushing them, being unable to sail against it, and then they soon come to a small uh, island south of Crete called Clauda. I think it's actually written wrong on your map there. Uh, here, the ship's dinghy. What's a dinghy? Uh, yeah, so it's a little tiny boat there. But the thing is, like your translation, it does. It, it, see, it just uses like another word for boat or ship, and you don't. It's sometimes hard to kind of figure out what's going on here. We learn here that the major, massive vessel that's holding hundreds of thousands of, of uh, tons of grain, and as we're going to see later, 276 passengers, also has a little dinghy. Okay, it's just kind of. And it, what, it, it, what it was actually doing at this point. Is that it was um, it was tugging it behind it as opposed to having it kind of like latched up. Okay. Um, here the ship's dinghy, the small boat used to transport passengers from the main vessel to land, began to take too much water, and Luke himself admits that he was involved in stabilizing the dinghy. Can someone read verse 16? Uh, running under the shelter of a small island called Claudia, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. Yeah. They say it could also be like the word skip, but it's basically it's a dinghy, okay? I've never been able to use that word in a biblical lecture before, so there you go. Dinghy. But you get the sense of what it is, yeah. All right, so 
yeah, this store is like picking up here. It's not just an easy little travel. We've got lots of different, you know, uh, cities and destination changes, and now we've got a crazy wind that's pushing them. And as you saw from the map, they're going to have to like just kind of drift all the way over until they happen to find the island of Malta. That's what we're going to uh, see in the story. All right. So in order to save it from sinking, okay, they utilize these ropes or cables that are wrapped around the hole. Okay. Now, it's not, 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 it's not actually clear whether, uh, in the Greek, if they began to wrap these things around the hole this time or if they were already there. The sense is that you have the ship. Let me actually draw this, okay? Um, you've got, you know, excuse my crew drawing here, okay? But around the ship, they would have, like, ropes or cables, and it would stabilize everything. It would keep it all kind of together. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. like think, of a, think of, like, a barrel. With like a barrel, you have to have something wrapping around it to keep all the pieces of wood together. Okay? And so, it's, it's, we don't know if, if they were like tightening these or if they were kind of like, you know, kind of like, you know, walking around and wrapping it around there, stabilizing this boat. That's kind of what's going on in the story at this particular point. Okay. Um, where are we at? Okay. The fear is that the nearby southward reefs of Sirtis, which actually was a known danger to sailors, sailors like looked out and feared these particular reefs, considered like the Bermuda Triangle. Like we used to talk about, like, oh, just don't sail in there because your ship will just get destroyed. They thought that these reefs might damage the vessel. Um, let me read my sentence. It makes sense when I read the whole thing. Okay. The fear that the nearby uh, southward reefs of Sirtis, a known danger to sailors, might damage the vessel and it cause them to let down one of their anchors. Okay? Uh, and the ship begins drifting westward, they're going all the way this way, and we begin, we can actually at this point begin to chart some of the chronology based on the indicators given by Luke. Okay? Let me tell you, like nautical terms and nautical travel, it's not my specialty, okay? It's not what I went, you know, to graduate school to learn biblical studies more, but it's just part of the story here. It's just kind of, kind of interesting. Okay, so we can get some of the chronology here. Uh, I did the best that I could to, to really try to keep this um, uh, clear in our minds. Okay, so in verses 14 through 19, we're going to see there's a three-day period, uh, which is at the mercy of the northeaster, which your text might actually use the, the Greek word. It's a combination of Greek word and Latin word, uh, uh, the Iroquois. Northeaster, probably what it means. Okay? Um, and then we see at the end of the 14th day, they actually approach Malta. And then the next day, the ship is actually wrecked. And all the passengers eventually make it safe to Malta. Uh, for three days, they actually um, uh, stay at a guy named uh, Publius's house. And then they stay there for about three months. So they were at like 110 days. Okay? So if this started like in October, 110 days later, we're, we're thinking like, November, December, January, uh, maybe pushing February, depends on you on your timeline. Okay. Um, all right, in the face of a rough storm, the crew begins to lighten the ship in hopes of survival. Okay, they don't care about they, they care about living, they don't care about someone else's cargo. All right. Um, by the way, this is an indicator that a life is more important than possessions. Wait a second, well, sorry, I'm not too sure about that. But if they were if they were Taking all this cargo to Rome, and if they were missing cargo, the Romans would have killed them. Because, like, even if you were to hinder, like, this Roman cargo, like, wheat and stuff, it seems like that you would have been, like, severely punished. Yeah, you don't know exactly what they threw over, um, but there's lots of other things on the ship that they could, they could throw over, um, you know, uh, sails or guns, or they could throw over, uh, you know, like, like, like leftover food or something. I don't know, like, just anything on the ship that they could just get rid of, like, just to lighten the boat. Because in the end, they just want to survive. You know, when it comes down to surviving or doing your job, like you're gonna do what it takes to survive. You know, they're kind of like desperation though. Um, uh, exactly it's like catch. the deadly storm that the deadly is catching the cargo. Yeah. Where they have to like throw over extra pots because they're about to die or something. That's what this reminds me. I mean, what, what's what's yeah, better to the Romans that? Oh, sorry, the whole ship got shipwrecked because we. They're trying to save everything, or we took some out and made yeah, it Yeah, it's like, hey, I was able to get like half of the cargo here as opposed to all of it being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And and these um the, the, the captains of these ships from Alexandria, uh, they would make a large profit. But as you're starting to see, this kind of vessel is like, it's a pretty dangerous thing. And he's actually choosing to willingly go through the difficult time of year um, 
during the difficult uh, travel period because no one else is doing it. You know, so demand is pretty high, the supply is pretty low. So he knows that he can make some extra money if he can just push a little bit more. You know, if he can just get a little bit more wind in these sails, if he can, you know, make a little bit of time. So that's what he's thinking. Problem. Okay. Um, so what I brought out there is that they they try to um, uh, dump a bunch of stuff off the boat. Um, Yeah, can somebody read uh, verse 18 and 19? Verses 18 and 19. The next day, as they were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Yeah, so they just, like they began to. It's this imperfect group. They just, they started doing it, this process that was going on here. Um, and uh, some of, by the way, some of the larger grain ships could carry uh, 1,200 tons of grain, which is 2.4 million pounds. It's a lot for a boat, by the way. Um, but some of them also just like the bare minimum. The bare minimum of these would be like 68 tons, which is still 136,000 pounds. You know how long it would take to like take this off of the ship? Like, oh. it's, it's, a, it's a major thing. It's a lot, I mean, it's a lot of grain. Okay, um, here's something that's interesting. Let me know what you think about this. Verse 20 indicates that the sun and the stars were darkened. Somebody read verse 20. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Okay, when he says that there was no small storm, what does that mean? Big storm. Big storm. It was a big storm. Okay, we've seen this, by the way. That he, he, he used this like, it was, you know, someone of no small reputation, you know, it means big reputation. Okay. But just kind of bear me out on my argument here. All right. So the, the argument about the sun and the stars being darkened, combined with the storm, which likely would have covered up the light from the moon, made it difficult for the ship to navigate. When, when Luke adds in the hope and save language, it seems that he is yet again making another allusion to Joel 2 and Acts 2.20. Remember Joel 2? Yep. All of these cosmic signs are going to take place because the Spirit has been poured out. And what was the function of the Spirit being poured out in the beginning of the book of Acts? To witness. Yeah, to enable people to witness, okay? All right. And so, these signs indicate the Spirit has come, Spirit enables faithful witnessing. And what happens here? Paul gets a chance to preach to them. Hmm. The ship eventually makes its way to Rome, where he's able to preach the message to people. I don't know. Maybe the he's alluding to that. I mean, the sun will be turned into darkness. And the moon will not shed its light? The moon will be blown. But the moon will Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what's going on there. I'm just saying. Like, like, that's what's going on. But you can see it's hard for them to travel when... They don't have any light when they can't see the stars when they, when they don't have the light of the moon. Okay? Um, this will be the, the last little part we do and then we'll take a break. Okay. Uh, it's here, by the way, that we see Luke beginning to employ the salvation language. I'll, I'll read over the passage again. I read over it last week. But well, you want to mark these in your Bible. In verse 20, where it says, Since neither uh, sun nor stars appear for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Then you skip down to verse 31. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Verse 34. Therefore I encourage you to take food, for this is for your preservation. Okay. Down in verse 43, the centurions wanted to bring Paul safely through. And then down in verse 44, the rest should follow, some on planks, others on various things in the ship. And so it happened that they were all brought safely to land. Chapter 28, verse 1. When they had been brought safely through, and the last one was in verse 4, when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began to say to one another, Undoubtedly, this man is a murderer, uh, though he has been saved from sea, just as they're not allowed him to live. Okay? All the salvation language. This is the question that came up on, the, uh, on your previous assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the answer I was ultimately looking for is that the function of this language within the book of Acts is to highlight how the gospel gets to Rome with salvation and rescue literally occurring on the vessel, taking the Jewish message to the Emperor Nero. The function of the book of Acts is the, the, the message of salvation is to start from Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria, and eventually get to Rome. And so what would be appropriate when Paul's finally, ultimately, making his way to Rome? 
We have all these reminders of salvation, security, preservation. So I think this is kind of a, like a, a strong literary function that Luke goes out of his way to use that sort of language and attentive reader be like, aha, it reminds me, it reminds me, this is why he's going to Rome. Mm -hmm. He's not going to Rome to face trial. He's going to Rome to, to preach the gospel, the gospel, okay? All right? And it's important that we keep that in mind because there are a lot of people that end the book of Acts, and we'll talk about this at the very end. Um, they, they get to the end of the book of Acts and they have all these unanswered questions because they come to the book of Acts with some expectations that the book of Acts is not trying to get. The book of Acts is telling us how the gospel started from Jerusalem, the Jewish movement, and eventually it made its way out to the ends of the earth, Rome uh, being a Gentile movement, or at least to the Gentiles. Okay. Um, Paul reminds them that they should have obeyed his warning. How do you nicely say that, by the way? Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay. Can somebody read uh, verse verses 21 through 24? When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in the midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Yeah. So again, he prophesies. He's like, hey, should you listen to me? No one is going to die, but what's going to be damaged? The ship. The ship. Okay? And he's like, hey, take courage. Relax. Because people are freaking out. Hmm. You, you understand that? Okay? So he reminds them that they should obey this warning. He assures the crew that no life will be lost. An angel appeared to him while he was on the boat. This appearing, by the way, is not mentioned by Luke. He just tells us that it happened. Assuring him that it is necessary for him to stand for the emperor. See that they're... Um, uh, you must stand before Caesar. It's kind of like a necessary type word. Okay. So we're going to take a break here. But uh, it's necessary for him to stand for the emperor. You've got to have a nice sound file. <laughs> the emperor says it's necessary. All right, let's take a break.